Okay, my name is Oray Gardner. I'm a Category Service Coordinator with the Student Equity and Achievement, and I'm the DSU Club Advisor. Okay. At this time, I'd like to call up Jessica Bogans, our BSU ICC rep. racism here in 1957. 
But it's nice that the newspaper presented this optimistic vision of how things could be and should be on a college campus. A few months later, in January 1958, Jesse Owens visits NBC. You might not immediately think of Owens as a civil rights leader, but as one scholar points out, many sports writers and historians alike have credited Owens for paving the way for civil rights. Owens was a conduit of change in which further change would take place. So Owens starts the conversation about civil rights. And certainly his athletic accomplishments were remarkable. For example, in 1935 at a college track meet, Owens set four world records in four events in a span of 45 minutes. To this day, many people believe this is one of the greatest athletic feats in history. The next year, Owens won four gold medals in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. These games were known as Hitler's Olympics because they were put on by the Nazi party. And as Larry Schwartz says, Owens single-handedly crushed Hitler's myth of Aryan supremacy. When he came back from the Olympics, people asked Owens if he was upset that Hitler refused to shake his hand. Owens replied, I wasn't invited to shake hands with Hitler, but I wasn't invited to the White House to shake hands with the president either. Franklin Roosevelt never invited Owens to the White House, never shook his hand, and never bothered to send a letter or telegram of congratulations. This was extremely painful for Owens. Later in life, Owens said, after I came home from the 1936 Olympics with my four medals, it became increasingly apparent that everyone was going to slap me on the back, want to shake my hand, or have me up to their suite, but no one was going to offer me a job. There was no television, no big advertising, no endorsements then. Not for a black man, anyway. So the next 20 years are really tough for Owens, but in the mid-1950s, the civil rights movement is gaining traction, and people are beginning to recognize and appreciate Owens for his accomplishments. He's hired for speaking engagements, and he especially enjoys talking to and inspiring young people. And this is what he was doing when he came to NBC in 1958. So on March 24, 1961, Martin Luther King Jr. spent the entire day on the NPC campus. Um, he was invited, invited here by the NPC Faculty <coughs> Spiritual and Moral Subcommittee. At 9.30 he gave an assembly and all classes were canceled so that all students could attend. He gave a press conference at 11.30, and then that evening, 1,400 people showed up for his lecture. Only 900 could fit into the armory, so the other 500 had to listen over the intercom in the student center and the library. The title of his talk was The Power of Nonviolence. Unfortunately, we don't have a recording or a transcript of what Martin Luther King said at NPC on that day, but we do have um, a quote from the student newspaper. And he said, if democracy is to live, segregation must die. Conditions in the world today do not permit us the luxury of an anemic democracy. We face a crisis in our race relations. We must achieve moral ends through moral means. Destructive means cannot bring about constructive ends. James Baldwin was professor in residence at MPC in April 1962. By the time Baldwin came here, he had already published a number of important works, including a semi-autobiographical novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and a collection of essays, Notes of a Native Son, which deals with the issues of racism and race relations. Both works frequently appear on top 100 lists of 20th century American literature. And as Henry Louis Gates Jr. points out, if Martin Luther King was the spoken voice of the civil rights movement, James Arthur Baldwin was its written voice, the movement in essays. While at NPC, Baldwin spoke to classes and gave a number of lectures. 
He talked about being an author, and he also talked about music and how the blues is an expression of the African American experience in this country. Here are some photos from the archives of Baldwin speaking to classes at NPC. After his time here, he began a lecture tour throughout the South on behalf of CORE, Congress on Racial Equality. Baldwin became so involved in the civil rights movement that just a year after being at NPC, Time Magazine used his image as the face of the civil rights movement on its May 1963 cover. Baldwin has definitely had a resurgence in the past few years, and you see him and his work referenced quite frequently. In 2016, the documentary, I Am Not Your Negro, was released, which is based on Baldwin's unfinished work, Remember This House. Uh, I really recommend this movie. You learn a lot about Baldwin, and you will really appreciate his intelligence, his eloquence, uh, and his bravery. It's a fantastic documentary, and if you haven't seen it, you can borrow the DVD from the NPC library, or watch it on Canopy, our streaming video service. And then, um, If Beale Street Could Talk, a movie based on a novel by Baldwin, was nominated for several Academy Awards last year. The following year, in September 1963, James Meredith spoke at MPC. Meredith was the first African American to enter and graduate from the University of Mississippi, which at the time was an all-white college. His entry in the Encyclopedia of African American History says, Meredith's admission to the University of Mississippi is regarded as a pivotal moment in the history of civil rights in the United States. He persisted through harassment and extreme isolation to graduate on August 18, 1963, with a degree in political science. So he gets his degree in August 1963, and just one month later, Meredith was here on the MPC campus, advocating for education as the best way forward for the civil rights movement. After his speech at NPC, someone in the audience asked him if he was afraid to be at the University of Mississippi where he was not wanted and where his life was in danger every day. And Meredith replied that his fear was that his son would grow up in a society that allows such discrimination and his son would look around him and think, what did my father do about this? This, Meredith said, was the fear that drove him. Meredith remained active in the civil rights movement. In 1966, he began what he called the March Against Fear, a solo 220-mile walk from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. But he was shot by a white gunman on the second day of his walk. Fortunately, he survived, and he's still alive today, living in Jackson, Mississippi. Horace Caton was at NPC just one month later, in October 1963. Caton was the author of the nonfiction work Black Metropolis, A Study of Negro Life in a Northern City, which is a history of the black community in Chicago's South Side. Later in life, Caton moved to Santa Cruz, so he had a unique local perspective on race relations in our area. And he had a lot to say about the white population of the Monterey Peninsula. He said, Monterey and Carmel are fairly civilized in a tired way, but I find the same attitude here that I find in the South. Deny the Negro's existence, and maybe he'll go away. <coughs> so Caton was really calling out the white community in our area, and he was saying, even though we're in California and not in the Deep South, there is still racism here. His point was that until people of color have equal access to employment, education, and housing, we are living in a racist society. And he finished his speech by saying, the United States is fighting for its life on the world scene because of the race issue. America is going to have to rediscover its values of morality or go under. I see the problem as essentially a white one, and it's up to the whites to solve it. As for me, 
I'll just sit back and agitate. When Ralph Bunch spoke at MPC in May 1964, he was here to talk about the importance of the United Nations, an organization which he helped found. Bunch had an impressive list of accomplishments. He was valedictorian of his class at UCLA in 1927. He received his doctorate from Harvard and became Harvard's first African-American tenured professor. Bunch was also the first African-American to win a Nobel Peace Prize, which he accomplished in 1950 for his mediation in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Although his purpose at NPC was to discuss the UN, Bunch was an important figure in the civil rights movement. The year before coming to NPC, he participated in the March on Washington, and the year after visiting NPC, he walked side by side with Martin Luther King in the march from Selma to Montgomery. Selma Watson George, who spoke at NPC in November 1965, was another important figure in the United Nations. In 1960, she became the first African-American woman appointed as a delegate to the UN. She also had an extremely interesting background as an expert on African-American music. For her doctoral dissertation, George compiled a guide to Negro music, which cataloged 12,000 musical compositions inspired by or written by African Americans. This was obviously a huge contribution to the history of African American culture and music. George was also an accomplished opera singer. In 1948, she was cast as the female lead in an opera called The Medium. This made her the first African American to play a lead role that was originally written for a white actor. In 1948, this was groundbreaking. The role was given to the best candidate without regard to the color of her skin. Her achievement was so important that in October 1950, George was on the cover of The Crisis, a publication of the NAACP. Dick Gregory, who came to NPC in April 1968, was a comedian and author who just passed away in 2017. He was a pioneer in comedy because he addressed current events and racial issues in his routines. He was also a civil rights activist who was good friends with Martin Luther King. Gregory came to speak at NPC primarily because he was running for president as a member of the Peace and Freedom Party. His talk was scheduled for April 5, 1968. About a week before his speech, the student newspaper said, Gregory contends that money spent on the war, this is the Vietnam War, could be put to better use in clearing up slums, a view he shares with Dr. Martin Luther King, an associate of his in the Alabama demonstrations. The topic for Gregory's lecture has not yet been chosen in order for him to make it more timely. But what happens the day before Gregory is scheduled to speak at NPC? Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated. On the left, you see a photo of a prayer vigil on the NPC campus. And on the right is Gregory kind of pondering the headlines that are announcing the death of his friend, Martin Luther King. Now, amazingly, Gregory's speech goes on as scheduled the day after the assassination. Um, again, we don't have a recording or a transcript of what he said, but we have pretty extensive quotations from the student paper. And he said, you young people will bear the burden of what happened. King was killed by a whole country, a sick society. I'll tell you how sick this country is. People who teach love, we hate. King wasn't killed by a white southerner. He was killed by an American in America. The world lost a great man. I'd be lying if I said there will be peace in this country. This will be the worst month in the history of man. Ours is the most racist society in the world. So you really get a sense of how impassioned his speech was and how he was sharing his anger and frustration with the NPC audience. The very next month, Harry Edwards is on campus. 
Campbell, or Edwards is credited with inventing the field of sports sociology, and he wrote a book called The Revolt of the Black Athlete, which just had its 50th anniversary printing. He was involved in the Olympic Project for Human Rights, and he is given credit for inspiring the Black Power Salute at the 1968 Olympics. Um, you're probably familiar with the photo on the cover of the book, which shows uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos on the medal podium with raised fists. Um, by the way, Smith and Carlos were students at San Jose State, and there's a statue on campus that commemorates this moment in history. <coughs> so this protest took place at the Olympics in October 1968, just a few months after Edwards was here on campus. So it's, a, it's amazing to me that many of these civil rights leaders came to NPC when they were at the peak of their influence and in the midst of some of their most important activities and protests. Edwards was one of the most radical civil rights leaders to speak at NPC. When he came here, he was a member of the Black Panthers, and he advocated radical change on campus. He said, if black students can't be part of this campus, we'll burn it down. And he was especially <coughs> critical of the curriculum. He said, for black students, it's misleading, degrading, and insulting. The books don't tell you that other races help to develop America, not just white folks. And then someone in the audience asked him, do you hate all white people? And he said, I don't have enough time to hate all the whites that deserve to be hated. Um, Edwards is still very active and outspoken today. He's um, a professor emeritus in the sociology department at Berkeley. He's a consultant for several professional sports teams. And he's still very involved in fighting racism. And he has an active Twitter account, in case you're interested in keeping up with what he's doing now. Uh, while we're talking about the Black Panthers, um, someone posted on Facebook last year that they remembered hearing Angela Davis speak at NPC. I did find a mention in the El Yankee that she was on campus in the spring of 1970. And I also know that she gave a speech at a Vietnam War protest at Fort Ord that many MPC students attended. A few months of the following fall after Harry Edwards spoke, things began to change on campus. The black students organized and became politically active. As a result, 21 of 31 positions in student government were held by members of the Black Student Union. So now that these students had the majority voice on campus, they were going to demand change. So they present the NPC administration with 22 demands. They wanted not only more classes, they also wanted a Department of Black Studies and a degree in Black Studies. By December of that year, the administration confirmed that seven new Black Studies courses would be added for the spring 1969 semester. So in February 1969, 51 years ago this month, the Black Studies Department was born. NPC hired four new instructors to teach in the new department. And it's amazing to me that these students accomplished so much in literally one semester. They make their demands in the fall of 1968, and by the spring of 1969, NPC has a Black Studies Department. In 1970, the name of the department was changed from Black Studies to Ethnic Studies in order to be more inclusive. Finally, I want to conclude my talk with Rosa Parks, who came to NPC 30 years ago in February 1990 to celebrate African American History Month. Her lecture, Civil Rights Then and Now, was attended by 2,000 people. And in a way, we've come full circle, because Rosa Parks is considered the mother of the civil rights movement. And her refusal to give up her bus seat to a white passenger in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955 really launched the civil rights movement. Here are some more photos of Rosa Parks at NPC. And I want to finish with a quote from Parks. I knew someone had to take the first step and I made up my mind not to move. Our mistreatment was just not right, and I was tired of it. 
So thank you for being here today. I really want to thank Elroy Garden Hire and the Black Student Union for providing all the delicious food today. And I also want to thank Elizabeth Thomas for all of her help with this event. Um, I also wanted to let you know that this presentation is available online on the library website. So if you go to the tab on the left-hand side under library, you'll see archives and special collections, and then under that is archives features. And that's where you'll find um, the slides for this presentation. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. And if you're interested in learning more about NPC's history, I post weekly on the library's social media pages using the hashtag LoveNPCHistory. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Well, I have a, a suggestion or a referral uh, for you and the audience that uh, at the Oldemeyer Center, they actually have a lot of newspapers up on the wall as part of their art exhibit. There are newspapers coming out of Fort Ord where there was a really strong movement. I know your focus was on the campus, but there was a lot of going back and forth. Yeah, and people I heard were just. That it's, it's, and you said it's at the Old, Old Meyer Center? The Old Meyer Center in Seaside. Okay. It's an art exhibit. I'm not sure that it continues after this month, so I want to okay. check it out. Yeah. There was a lot of black speakers in Kingston, D.C. back in those days, and most of them were from the South. What drifted them? How did they find their D.C.? I mean, what drew them to D.C.? I think they were invited here by, um, there were civil rights uh, organizations on campus, and also in, in Monterey in general, and they were invited to, to come here and speak. Angela Davis was back on MPC campus like 15, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah, I know she's um, she's at UC Santa Cruz, I think, and I have reached out to her. I've emailed her a couple times, and please tell me about the members of MPC, but I, I haven't heard back from her. So. And she did speak at, it was at the uh, lecture forum, I think. Yeah, I have not. I, that's what I've heard, but I haven't seen it documented anywhere, so I'd love to talk to people who might have been there. Give me another hand for women. Okay, so at this time, um, I just want to take a few moments to um, give out some presentations. Um, the Black Student Union is a club here at NPC, represented in the club council, the ICC. Um, everything you see here today is student led. Okay, when I was a student here, uh, at the time the Dean of Student Services told me, if you want to get something done, the students have to leave it, okay? So these students have worked tirelessly throughout the month for this day to come up. Um, so at this time, I'd like to call up uh, Nina, the BSU president. Let's see.
And these are just token of our appreciation. I'd like to give you guys an appreciation award for all your hard work. We reached out to Wendy like three years ago for this presentation. Um, it started in the Council Norm Room, where we had six people, which included me and her. <laughs> and so as the time grew, and last year we probably had half this amount of people. Um, this year we dealt with numbers. Um, like we always tell you know what, there is what we already have. Okay? We're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're just trying to work what we have to represent our students no matter what color they are. Okay? So once again, this time so we're going to have closing remarks by our Vice President of Student Services. Right. Again, I'm not going to say um, uh, a whole bunch, but um, I am deeply touched by the work that you have done over the years. By affording us an opportunity to be educated on what's happening here on the peninsula and our college. I learned something. I've always said I've been deeply rooted in our community and I've been proud of our community. But what I'm most proud of is the work that our students do. What you have done for our college today is monumental. Now I know it comes with leadership, but your voice is so important. I've had the opportunity to be here a long time. A long time. And I said I've always been down for the cause. And I have been on a one-on-one -on -one basis. What you guys are doing right now is you're establishing a movement to embrace all of us around here to get engaged. And some of you may have heard it before, when we talk about lifelong learning, that's important. But I've heard something about what life wide learning, life deep learning. What you're doing today is life wide learning. Expanding relationships that go beyond the African American heritage and culture. Look around the room. This is life wide learning. And then life deep learning. What we learned today was how rich our history is. And you were responsible for making that happen. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge MPC's first year here in 2019 of being a Moser affiliated campus. That's something that I know over the years we've always been associated with African American heritage. We've been down for the culture. But what has happened this year is we've taken it to the next level. We're in a Moshe affiliated campus. Thank you. Why don't you come on up and be part of the crew? Linda, why don't you come up and be part of the crew? Thank you. This is part of the community. And then I'm going to take it one step further. I don't like putting people on the spot. But we have someone in the room that's taken to the next level, and that's our board chair. Yeah. Tomorrow, at tomorrow's board meeting, there's going to be a resolution to acknowledge Black History Month and what the contributions that have been made by our African American heritage, but what also the commitments that MPC has made. So please come up and let's acknowledge you for being the board chair, first African American board chair. <laughs> Life deep learning, this is what it's about. I see Fred here. We had a conversation the other night about a STEM activity where we're going to bring a leading African American paleontologist to campus. Hopefully, all of us will be there to support that. <coughs> You'll be there to support that. I can go around the room and I see Keith here. I can tell you that we're expanding our commitment to African American heritage. <coughs> Make sure that this campus is welcoming and inclusive. Thank you for making a commitment to be here. And again, I know that there's a group of people here, 
But if you could please stand, you made it a point to be here to share in this experience with us. They say that African American culture and heritage is important, not only for us who have different cues, but for everyone who steps onto this campus. So please stand and let's give each other a round of applause. saying that it is important. So thank you very much. And again, if you'd like to say a few words, we'll step aside. <laughs> Calling Larry, it's not fair. Um, I'm not the reason for the resolution tomorrow. This okay. community is. Okay. And it was really important to me as the chair of the board that we take a moment to recognize African American History Month, Black History Month, and celebrate the students that we have on campus in our community and as a board reaffirm every chance we have our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion on this campus. So that's why we're doing it. And I hope that as many of you as possible will join us tomorrow so that, that the entire board can see that we have a beautiful, multicultural, multicolored face at MPC and that it's our responsibility to represent all students and to offer courses and programs and events that celebrate and lift us all up and help us recognize who we are and and take us into where we want to be in the future. So I just really want to appreciate you all for doing this. This was so, I, I learned a lot today. It was really moving and to, to know that this campus had so many important leaders come in to speak and um, and I wish there had other members of the community who have been here today to hear that because it's, it's a rich history and I'm proud to be a part of it and I'm so thankful for you all for, for offering this to us today. Once again, we appreciate everybody coming out. Another wonderful event. Um, in closing of Black History Month, this Friday at 5.30 to 8.30 in the Student Center, we just have another fun-filled night of trivia games, music, and food. So everyone's invited. Come out and share some time with us. Thank you for coming out.